He's always seeking and calling, and he really hopes that we will get it, you know. He really hopes that we get it, we get it, we get it. This morning, I want us to reflect a bit on the Ephesians passage that was read, Ephesians chapter 2. And um, it's, it's, it's an interesting and known uh, scripture. In fact, some people will contend that every good Methodist should be familiar at least with verse 8 and verse 9 since it is they are so critical and central to our teachings as a Christian community. One of the doctrines we emphasize in the Methodist Church is captured well in these two verses. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This for many is the centerpiece of Christianity. This keeps all other doctrines in focus and perhaps is another way of expressing John 3.16. For God so loved the world, grace, love, that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him through faith should not perish but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Gracious God, speak and may we hear you speak. May we understand your word and seek to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> As I read Ephesians 2, perhaps if I could just take you back to read a few verses and then go through some things. Paul speaking to Christians in a place known as Ephesus. As you would know, that's why it's Ephesians. Says, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, verse 1 and 2 following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of the flesh, of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who in rich, is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he had loved us, so that even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. I'm not sure why the, the, the Spirit nudged me in that way, but as I read these verses, hearing Paul speak to the believers in Ephesus, the way, the tone of his writing, the way in which he was speaking, it sounded to me in such a manner that it made me ask and consider the question, do you know you? Of course, I could say, do you know yourself and all other ways of formulation, but I, I couldn't help but ask myself. I, I don't know why it, it, it just stuck with me. Do you know you? Do you know your strengths? And your weaknesses, do you know you? 
Do you know your vulnerabilities and possibilities? Do you know you? Do you know what is your best potential? Do you truly know you? Most times people who are fairly self-confident and successful at their various ventures in life, people who seem to be able to function with some level of acceptability will answer this question with some confidence. Yes, I, I know myself, I, I know me. But do you really know you? Interestingly enough, psychologists, I think, make reference to something called the Johari window. And in that window, there are four sections. And it says, there's one section which identifies what you know about yourself, but nobody else knows. There's another section, they say, that you and other people know about you. And then they say there's another section. How many sections I said there's supposed to be? Four. They say there's another section which others know about you, but you don't know about yourself. And still another section, which they say neither you nor others know. Now, if I were to use Johari, it says we really only half know ourselves. <laughs> because there's only two of the four windows where we seem to know something about ourselves. So psychologists seem to be suggesting that, in a sense, we really don't know ourselves. And, and maybe there are other ways to explain that, in that certainly we will know more of ourselves when we are connected with other people. But I've wondered, what about the fourth window? <laughs> I haven't done any thorough research on, on what Johari intended and intended. But it takes me back to the question, do you know you? This question also asks, essentially, do you know where you have come from? Do you know who you are and where you are? And do you know where you're going, your hope, your destiny? Do you know you? You will remember a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we considered the, the question of knowing where we have come from as a fundamental part of knowing ourselves. You remember I mentioned that I've made a commitment here on that whenever I'm going to identify, introduce myself, I will now introduce myself Adolf Davis, son of, and not just Adolf Davis, husband and father of. Interestingly enough, not going too far off, there's a, for those who are in the basketball world, there was an interesting thing yesterday I saw on the, well, on the news, where Patrick Ewing, so those who have been around basketball a little bit would know, Patrick Ewing is an iconic New York Knicks basketballer. And, cut, and, and Madison Square Garden is the home of basketball. And Patrick Ewing went to Madison Square Garden. I don't know if he may have taken up a new job or something of the sort. And the number of times he had to produce his ID and be interrogated and stopped by security. Um, it seemed to have been more than once. He was flabbergasted. His name and number was in the rafters. So they have essentially immortalized his contribution to basketball in Madison Square Garden. Yet persons who are now working there in 2021 have no idea who Patrick Ewing is. In fact, seeing him walking in said, where you going, big man? And so the persons were thinking, what? How could it be possible in a basketball arena they not know one of the icons of basketball. Why? Because the truth is we really don't have a sense of where we have come from. And the truth is, in that sociological, histolo historical sense, if we don't know where we have come from, then we really don't know who we are. 
do you know you? Equally true is if we don't understand our current reality, then we really don't know ourselves. And what is worse is if we don't even know where we can reach our potential, what is possible in our lives. If we don't have a sense of what is achievable and, and where our lives can get to, wow, that's even perhaps even worse. Do you know you? You may know your gifts. You may have a fairly good grip and grasp of your personality. You may know what gets you upset. You may know what kind of foods you like or don't like. You may know what kind of people you like to be around and don't like to be around. Or perhaps as the talk radio morning thing say, you know where does get your vex? But do you know you? Do you know you? Whether you, whether you truly appreciate and understand it or not, you are both physical and spiritual. So you may know how tall you are. You may know your body mass index. <laughs> You may know what diseases or sicknesses you have. You may know what color your eyes are. But do you know you? Perhaps a related question to connect some dots is are you saved since if you are not saved, then immediately, without any further qualification, I could say you really don't know yourself. You see, that's why I said, do you know you? Because you are not just physical, you are also spiritual. Perhaps the question coined most specific to the text of Ephesians would be, do you remember who you are? Or have you forgotten who you are? You see, when you read Ephesians, and you know, because as I said, when I started reading it, the first thing that jumped out at me is as if Paul was trying to tell them who they were. Because here Paul saying, you were dead in your trespasses in which you once lived, following the, the power of this air. And, and I'm thinking, Paul is telling them about themselves. Are you getting that? Paul is telling them about themselves. But then, again, pondering on the text, Paul explains where they came from. He explains where they are and effectively where they should be going. So I found myself thinking, but, but if they are already saved, because Paul says, for by grace you have been saved, then how is he explaining to them who they are when they should already know who they are? Why is Paul here telling them, this is what you are, this is who you are, and this is where you're going? If they've already been saved, because if they had already been saved, then I would suspect that they understood this stuff. And then I read on a little bit. So you just got to read this thing. It's not a lazy work, the Bible. Verse 11 and following, it helps you to understand why Paul is saying what he said. This is what he said in 11. You, you're with me? He says here, So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles by birth. And he continues. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time without Christ. Are you seeing this? 
So then I understood that what Paul was essentially doing is reminding them of who they were, where they have come from, where they are, and where they ought to get to. Hmm. So why did Paul want to remind them? Because I suspect it connects back with chapter 1. What is his desire and prayer for them? Chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. This is what Paul says. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, which is in a sense understanding, as you come to know him. Why? So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope for which you have been, you have, he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints. Whoa! So Paul is saying here, I, my desire for you is that you would understand, come on, are you with me? You would understand who you are, where you have come from, and effectively that would enable you to appreciate where God wants you to be. Hmm. So if you do not understand, sorry, if you do know you, then Paul is essentially saying you'll understand three important things. Say one, you were dead in trespasses and in sin. Two, you were saved by grace. Three, your hope is in Christ. And I'll explain what he means. He talks about where you're going. Paul says, if you really know yourself, you will understand who you were, who you are, and who you ought to be. And this is deeper than simply your, your gifts and talents and abilities. Because guess what? Without a true appreciation for the fundamental nature of man, all this stuff you know about yourself amounts to nothing really. Because who you were and are and ought to become are essentially connected. If you don't get number one and number two right, you can't get number three right. Meaning, if you don't know who you were, and I'm using were here relative to the Ephesians, because for some people it would be who they are. So if you don't know number one, then you're not going to understand number two and you will never get to number three. You'll never figure out number three. So, if you are to truly know yourself deeper than simply knowing who your mother and father is, and even deeper than knowing who your grandmother and grandfather is, and even deeper than knowing what you're good at, Knowing yourself deeper than that. Because who you are is more than your talents and abilities and gifts. It has to do with your very nature. Mm. Paul says, the most fundamental thing to understand is where we start. And he says, you were dead in your trespasses, dead. So when Paul talks about the Ephesians people as people who were, were dead, I'm thinking, wow, it's a strong language. So in a sense, there's a sense, there's a kind of a paradox in which we exist because in one sense we are living while in another we are dead. So in a sense, before we know Christ, we are all living dead. Before we know Christ, we are all living dead. 
Now hear the problem. That's why we don't even know ourselves. Because very often, we focus on the living, but don't realize we're still dead. So before we know Christ, before we understand who we really are, we focus on the fact that we have a job, we focus on the fact that we help people, we focus on the fact that we physically go to church, we focus on the fact that we have a family, we focus on the fact that we build a house, we focus on the fact that we have an education, and guess what? We think we're alive. But Paul is saying, you don't know yourself because until you understand who you truly are in Christ, then you will not realize that while you are walking up and down and you appear to be alive, you are really living dead. Do you know you? Do you know you? Dead, why? Roman says dead because you say it's a consequence of sin. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And I want you to understand why dead. Because dead, because it is your current state. Hear me well. Until you are saved, you are currently dead. Now let me explain what I mean here. And I don't think people understand that enough. So that if you understand that until you get to number two, saved by grace, that you are living dead, you don't understand that that is why when you die physically in that dead state, hello? That's why essentially you go to a lost eternity. Let me explain it differently. Until you know Christ, you are currently dead. So, if you die in that moment when you're dead, as old people, as some fellas in the village used to say, then you know you're D-E-D dead. Are you with me? Let me put it again. Let me emphasize it. Without being saved, which is to bring life to your death, you are dead spiritually and fundamentally you are dead. Because while you may be walking around in the physical sense, that you are actually eternally spiritually, fundamentally dead. And that's why anytime you physically die while you're dead, you're dead, dead. Are, are you getting what I'm saying here? We, I don't think we grasp that, that so long as we are dead, even though we are walking up and down, when physical death comes, it is in that dead state that we dead. So it's not as if we are alive. And when we dead, then all of a sudden, that's when things gone contrary and we hope that maybe somebody could get into heaven. No, if currently you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior, you are currently dead. You may not be physically in hell, but you already have your passport. Hello, are you with me here? So while you are here in the flesh, Paul is saying you are essentially dead. 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 
You see, and maybe that's part of our problem. We, we are so caught up in our physical living that we don't realize that we are spiritually not dying, you know, dead. You see, and I'm, I'm telling you, I, when I read it, I said, maybe we are dying. No, we're not dead. And then I realized, no, 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 no. We are not dying. We are already dead. So that the problem I had is I married the physical and the spiritual. So I thought, maybe like Adam and Eve. You remember when Adam and Eve ate the fruit? Satan had said, you would not die. And I suspected for Adam and Eve, when they ate the fruit, they're thinking, oh wait, it's true, I ain't dead. Hello? But look, Adam, we still the hair. And they didn't realize. Because now all we were seeing is with physical eyes and not paying attention to a death that had already taken place. And so we are fortunate while alive we have an opportunity for the dead to be resuscitated to life. So that living only provides us with an opportunity, physical living, to come out of our dead state. And when we physically die dead, our physical is just meeting up with the already spiritual. That perhaps is why Jesus responded to Satan and said, man shall not live by bread alone. Why? That is what? Feeding physical. <laughs> but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth, that's what what? Spiritual. Are you with me? You see, when we are physically and spiritually dead, what we are doing is that all that really sustains us is bread, is food, is physical exercise and activity. But when we are spiritually alive, it's not bread and physical activity alone that sustains us. But we are now sustained, we now live by the word of God. Anybody hearing me? So that until we are living, being nourished and sustained by God's word, then we are dead because all we're doing is eating food. Do you really know you? Hello, are you with me? <laughs> One commentator says, dead is visible as we see the rotting and the decay in our lives and in our world. When you smell what is happening in our world, you smell the nastiness of sin. That's the decay taking place because we are dead. That's why John 3.16, which we, we, we love so well and, 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 and read, goes into chapter 17. Are you, are you still with me here? You with me? So that it is on the one hand, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it goes on to say indeed God did not send his son into the world to do what? Condemn the world but that those who believe in him should be saved. Are you with me? And then it goes on, verse 18. Those who believe in him are not what? Condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already. 
say you're done dead already. You are already assigned to hell. Essentially, if we, if we grasp what Paul is saying here, it seems to suggest that when we get saved, we are rescued from hell. It's not that God sends us to hell. We're done going there already. That's our home. Until we are saved, we are not rescued from that place. Do you know you? That's why Paul, Paul says, let me tell you about yourselves, what you once were. And for those who are not saved, he said, this is who you are. He said, you're dead through your trespasses and sin. Because of sin, you're dead. Don't fool yourself. You're not, you're not good because you do good. You're dead because of sin. He didn't say how much sins. He didn't say if you had 10 sin and 11 sin. This is not some nonsensical Middle Eastern weighing good against bad. So you're not dead if you have more good than bad. That's nonsense. Paul is saying the very fact of sin in your life means you're done dead. He says, this is how you live. Or lived. You follow the course, the direction of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air. <laughs> that spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. Do you know you? Because we, we most of the time we don't see ourselves like this. No, 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 no. You ask the average person, saved or not saved, well, not saved, those who are not saved, and those, even sometimes those who are saved who lose their way. You ask them if they're following Satan. I guarantee you, you will hardly hear anybody acknowledge, I'm following the ruler of the power of the air. Satan is really the reference, say, the terminology. We don't even know. No, not at all. I, I, I know I ain't perfect, <laughs> but I ain't gonna say I follow in Satan. I know I can't tell you, you know, Rev, that I gave my life to the Lord, I saved, but, but I, you know, I, I don't follow Satan. You know what I mean? You don't even know yourself. Hello. Paul says, this is the very nature. This is the way people who are living, who are disobedient. Good people don't see themselves in the language of disobedience. People who are nice people, people who are good church going people, people who are trying to help other people, people who are morally good people, they don't categorize themselves as disobedient, left that to the children. It's because you don't know yourself. Do you really know you? Do you really know you? Are you, are you still with me here? <laughs> Nobody sees themselves when they're living in sin as effectively already in hell. We above virtually see ourselves in heaven just have a few things to sort out to make sure. Paul says no. And that's why Paul then goes on to say, it is by God's grace, his undeserved love, that we are saved. In other words, he's saying it is God who rescues us from death. That's why Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is profound. So that what it says is that here, God snatches us from death. 
because we cannot rescue ourselves. It's, it's sad that we don't know who we really are. And one of the biggest mistakes we make is we overestimate our abilities and our importance. So we think we could make it out from death by ourselves. Oh, how stupid is that? When you're dead, there ain't nothing you could do for yourself. Because you're dead. <laughs> the only way dead could have come back to life is when an external agency enables the resuscitation of the dead. That's why we are dead, because we cannot rescue ourselves from our situation. It has to be the external activity of God that brings us back to life. <laughs> Almost like when people apply CPR and them kind of thing, they, and pump, beep, 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 beat the chest hard for the heart to walk again. I don't know if you have ever seen anybody who is on that point of death beating their own chest and giving themselves mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Hello! That even when we are physically dying, it is the external activity at work that gets us back to life. Same way spiritually. The dead cannot bring themselves back to life. Only God can. Hello? Only God can. The only person who can save you from your death is God in Jesus Christ. You would be only foolish to think you could save yourself. Guess what? If you think you're saving yourself from death, you're really dreaming while dead. You can't do nothing about yourself. That's why it says God so loved the world that he did the work for us to pull us out. We just have to trust him. Hello, are you with me? Do you really know you? <laughs> and so part of that fundamental question Paul explores is do you have a real sense of your destiny? What you are destined for? You know, for years, the church emphasized the, the, the importance of heaven. And unfortunately, there was a period of time in our history as a church where we so emphasized heaven that it seemed to have disregarded that we are here. And so you've heard people say we are so heavenly minded that we have no earthly use. Yes, that is true. That has happened. But what we have to be careful of is that we may have fallen prey to the reverse. But forget that the hymn writer was right. This world is not supposed to be my home. <laughs> I'm supposed to really just be passing through. I have to make the best of my journey. But this is not my destination. You and I are not born for here. Come on, are you hearing me here? You and I were not born for here. So yes, we build a house. Yes, we buy a car. But the problem with too many of us is that we think that these are what really we are living for. But Paul is saying here, this is not your destiny. This is not what is possible for you. Paul is making the point that you are made for more and greater and better. It's possible. You don't have to remain dead. Isn't that why Jesus came? That we should not perish 
but we should have <laughs> that's our destiny you know that that's what is possible for you and me our best potential as human beings is not decay and sin our the best that you could be and I could be is to be with God eternally that's our destiny brothers and sisters that's why when Jesus came John 14 he told them I'm going so that where I am there that's where that's what is possible for you you know what troubles me in John 14 one of the disciples having been with Jesus for a couple of years he said but we don't know where you're going so how could we know the way Thomas you're joking so then you mean to tell me Thomas was in church all these years Anybody hearing me here? Thomas reads his Bible at least every now and then. You mean to tell me Thomas heard other people's testimonies? Brother Gomes? <laughs> eh? You mean to tell me Thomas listened to the teachings of Jesus? You mean to tell me Thomas heard Jesus speak about his purpose, about where he had come from, about why he had come? And Thomas is saying, I, I, I don't know where we, we're supposed to go. He said, Wow. He said, What? But then, isn't that just as true today as it was? yesterday and many of us are saying Lord we really don't know where we're going so how could we know the way that's why Jesus responded to Thomas Jesus said Thomas but I am the way the truth and the life no one gets where to the father that's where you belong Thomas Thomas that's where you belong no one comes to the father except through me but if you know me you would know my father also from now on you should you do know him and I've seen him Lord Philip, he said this thing get was and was are sorry, children. That's not a proper English word. Philip, John fourteen. Philip, verse eight adds. You saw Thomas was unique. Lord of mercy, church people. These things sometimes remind me of what we're battling with today in 2021. Here's Thomas now. Lord. Philip, sorry. Thank you. you see, you're paying attention. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Here, Jesus. What? Could, could multimedia bring it up for me, please? John 14, 9, because I want to read this one together. This, this just sounds like we, we, what is still a real problem. We just don't get it. We don't have a sense of where we belong. We don't have a sense of what we were made for. Death seemed to have blinded our eyes and corrupted our vision. Anybody with me here? We are so dead that we think death is normal. That we don't realize we were made for life in Christ. Come, let's read it together. Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How could you still say? Mm. How could you not get it, man? How could you not get it? So it makes me ask, do you really know you? For those who are not yet saved, have no doubt you don't know yourself. You think you know yourself. <laughs> and for those who say, Paul, say, I'm reminding you, this is what you were, this is who you are, and this is where you're destined to be with the Father. Do you really know you? Walk around confidently, telling others what they must do and how they must live. Analyzing people's flaws, recommending what they must do and how they must live. But do you really know you? You bubble with confidence. Even at the point sometimes of arrogance. But do you really know you? You read extensively. And you are perhaps inundated with knowledge. You roam the internet. And speak with confidence about everything that you read and know. But do you really know you people admire you and commend you for your gifts and talents and abilities but do you really know you you do well at your job very successful in your endeavors but do you really know you because if you know you you would know that outside of Christ, you're dead. Dead, dead, dead. That while physically you are active, that at your core, you are rotting and decaying. And without realizing it, more and more, you smell. Because you affect and infect other people. But you don't even realize it. Because sometimes you think you're good. So you really don't know you. Let me give an example before I close. A good dead person decaying rotting and they don't even realize the stench they put off and how they are affecting others adversely so hear what you live and you have a bit of dishonesty in your transactions But other than that, you're a good person, church person, kind person. And what you don't know is that there are persons around you who are being poisoned by you because they now feel a little bit of dishonesty is not bad after all. Hello, are you with me? Are you sure you're with me? Oh, you have a child and you're not married. And you don't even realize that because it seems to be working out for you, 
you're poisoning somebody else. They're thinking, well, I would like to get married, but if it ain't work out, so, you know, I know people who ain't married and they get child and it work out well. Come on, are you hearing that? You see, we don't realize how our death and decay poisons the world around us. You really don't know you. Because Paul says, if you know you, you will know you are dead in trespasses. You would know you were dead in trespasses. And if you know you, you would know the only way you could be with the Father. You could be rescued from this death and decay is by a full and total surrender to Jesus Christ. Anything else, nothing else will do because it is only by grace that we can be saved. God rescuing us from this mess we're in that we don't even at times realize we're in. That's why Paul prays, and this is my prayer. My prayer, my brothers and sisters, is this. As Paul prayed that, oh God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give all of us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we will come to know him spirit of wisdom and revelation so we'll understand who we really are so that we'll see with clearer eyes a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we wouldn't be deceived and misled a spirit of wisdom and revelation so we will know that before we surrender to Christ, we were dead in trespasses. So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, enlightened. This is a true enlightenment. This is a true enlightenment that comes in and through Christ. We may know what is the hope, hope, future, anticipating better to which God has called us what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints this is my prayer that we will know what is our inheritance what God made us for because truth is this world is not our home our real treasures are made up Somewhere beyond the blue. Amen. Amen. Amen.